And that's why the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers include security. Alright, it's George Rabb. I don't think I need to say anything. <laughs> Hi, everybody! Yay, thank you so much for coming. Really, really, thank you. I know there's like a billion things going on, and you get to watch like Adam Savage's colonoscopy and everything, and it's like, thank you for coming to this. I really appreciate it. Now, uh, the sound is kind of weird in this room, so if at any point you can't hear, there's nothing we can do about it. So, uh, no, uh, let, let us know. We'll try to adjust. Uh, I don't know if there's any more seats up front if you're just coming in late, but don't, don't worry. Um, the coolest costume... The coolest costume I've seen so far, and I don't know if it's, if it's what I think it is. <laughs> but here's the thing, there and it's brilliant. If it is the thing that I think it is, and I think the fact that I don't really know if it is the thing that I think it is makes it so fucking brilliant, okay? I'm gonna curse because it's just, it's me, so no surprise there, right? Um, there was like a, a little family like that walked in about eight minutes ago, and the kid was like, it's starting in seven minutes. And mom was like, oh, I think we're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> Which was fine. Which I'm like, good idea, good idea. Anyway, so the most brilliant costume is, was it was a zombie costume, okay? Now, that wasn't the, the most brilliant thing about it. But the zombie had a zombie walk, okay? Yeah. Have, you seen, have you seen what you know what I'm talking about? It's a guy, and he has this zombie walk. And I don't know if it's like an actual birth defect, you know, like, or whatever the term is that is very cool to use, wh whatever it is, or if he's just really in character. <laughs> and either way, it is the coolest thing. Because, like, what a way to go. It's like, screw it, you know what? I, you know, I got this Mondo limp, and I'm just going to, like, eat brains all weekend. <laughs> so cool. So if you don't know, we do have... Uh, a question card. I don't know if there's any left, but if you haven't filled out a question, be sure to fill it out. We will do that at some point. Yes, there. Uh, uh, of course, anything, anything goes. All right, where to start? Oh my gosh. <laughs> For those of you that do listen to the show and have never actually seen Misinformation, there she is, right there, Misinformation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be really ragtag because, because yeah, we haven't slept in in, for in, in, in days and days. So uh, uh, so last night last night there was the skeptics panel. I don't know if, how many of you saw the skeptics panel. Yes, yes, it was wasn't quite as as organized as this, but um, <laughs> it was good. And you know I think the important thing in any panel is to have at least eighteen open mics on stage. That's usually like the best plan. It was great. I mean, it ended up being really great. Now, uh, amongst the, the panelry, panelists, panel members, amongst our uh, panelry are such diverse guests as uh, the MST3K guys. Uh, uh, oh, what did that say, by the way? I just heard my little thing. Is that Marion? Yes. Saying no, saying yes, saying no. Really? Wow, OK. Um, um, what was I saying? God damn it. <laughs> panel, yes. Okay, so on the panel were, amongst the fabulous skeptics, were the Mystery Science Theater guys. Perhaps you've heard of this program called Mystery Science Theater, you know, of which I speak. Yes, hello. Okay, so it's Kevin Murphy and Bill Corbett. Now, these are, if you don't know what Mystery Science Theater is, I mean, it is the preeminent, first and foremost, uh, snarky talking back to the screen program that that ever existed it was a cable show that was done for you know a uh, uh, public public domain movies they would make fun of these movies and it's brilliant if you've never watched mystery science theater you have to watch mystery science theater because it's great there's like 18 dvd box sets and these are there's they're so good now that two casts have kind of formed post show you have the uh, riff tracks which is Kevin Murphy and, and that whole group, sure, sure, sure. And then you have the cinematic Titanic, which is more the, the, the first kind of cast that was from it. And I don't think that they wrestle or they have any kind of blood fights or anything, but, but they're just, there's that good that you can buy, st still get these downloadable commentary of movies. You know, it's brilliant, it's great. So, 
The point being, Kevin Murphy and Bill Corbett are professional snarkmeisters. This is like what they do for a living, right? Okay? Why would you go to this thing <laughs> and sit and comment from the audience? You know what I mean? Like, behind me, a couple rows back, like, throughout the entire fucking thing, someone was making comments. And I was like, Tom Servo is on stage! Shut the fuck up! Like, please! Like, what you're gonna come up with off, off the cusp is gonna be better than fucking Crow Robot? Are you kidding me? Like, shut up! Like, I didn't say a word the whole time until I spit, but that wasn't a word, it was spitting, which was a separate thing, which I, I was, was like debating, like, okay, do I do this or not? But it just, it like, I know, I know that people want to participate and be a part of it, you know? But like, it, it, it would be like going to Wimbledon and serving from the audience, you know? Like, <laughs> eh? Eh? it's like, that wasn't even in the court! Like, what are you doing? But the, the, the coolest thing was, was those of you that did see it, I'll give you the very, the very short kind of condensed version. Uh, after, after three spit takes that I took, uh, the fourth spit take was, was considered by experts to be the funniest one, which in itself, to have the fourth one be the funniest, but to have Tom Servo, a.k.a. Kevin Murphy, set me up for a spit take. As someone who's watched Mystery Science Theater for the last 20 years, I almost went home after that, because it was like... <laughs> What, what else are we going to do? What else is going to happen af after that? That's pretty much, pretty much it. And, and he said, uh, at the end of the thing, Kevin said, uh, uh, you've got a really good voice. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you very much. I, <laughs> you're really cool. <laughs> I said, do you do radio? I said, well, I have a podcast. But yeah, you wouldn't like it, isn't it? Because <laughs> I just suck at that stuff, which is so funny. Um, so that was really cool. Before that, before that, there were, was it right before that? I think it was right before that. There were two, there were two uh, Christian proselytizing dudes out in front of the skeptic track, <laughs> which is, I mean, huge balls. I mean, huge balls. You got to <laughs> give it up. You got to give it up. Uh, I was walking past and Danny Kay was talking and I was just walking or going to the bathroom or something. And Danny Kay from New York, he kind of like said, Geo, Geo, <laughs> like like this signal flare, <laughs> like <laughs> need to debate religion, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like it was like the bat signal. I just thought like okay, you know, <laughs> logic to speed, <laughs> and then we just like came up. And he said, D -d -d which 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 book of the Bible is this is, is the, the 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 one that was written the furthest the furthest because I don't know which which book was after the furthest one written from from the original from the, and I said John are you talking about John John is the one that's furthest from the source he's like oh okay okay so I said you know Mark, they pretty much think that Mark is about thirty years after and, and Luke is about like like thirty or sixty years after and then John is like way after John is like a hundred or two hundred years after you know information that I just have because at some point I was a Catholic getting buggered in the in the rectory but. <laughs> So I got something out of it, you know, <laughs> apart from an occasional postcard from Father Michael. But uh, um, <laughs> so we started this very sort of, it started with a very technical question about the books of the Bible, and it turned into this really cool discussion. And the entire time, all I heard in my, the way back of my brain was Phil Plate saying, don't be a dick, don't be a dick, don't be a dick, don't be a dick. Don't be a dick, don't be a dick. Don't be a dick, don't be a dick, don't be a dick. George, don't be. That's my Phil Plate impression, by the way. <laughs> George, this is Phil Plate. <laughs> Holy holly, alakalakalakala. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Now, if any one of us was filmed for like, you know, six to ten hours a day, you could edit it, and I w any one of us would look like a total idiot saying the same thing over and over and over and over. So that's an editor's choice. That's not necessarily the fact that Phil likes to say that every third word. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, so I hear in the back of my head, don't be a dick. And I'm, I got to tell you, I'm glad. I'm glad, because I probably, before Tam, before I, d I didn't go to Tam, but before I saw, all right, for those of you that don't necessarily uh, uh, listen to my show or know what's going on, Phil Plate is this very handsome gentleman. <laughs> Shaved head, glasses, he's very attractive. <laughs> um, 
who gave a lecture saying that we as skeptics, we as skeptics, not so much atheists, but more about skeptics, need to sort of not be, not be dicks. I, I don't think it was officially called Don't Be a Dick. I doubt that was in the program. Uh, I don't think it was. I'm not sure. But uh, it kind of got the subtitle of Don't Be a Dick with the idea being that what we're trying to proselytize is a hard sell to begin with. Because essentially critical thinkers and, and non-religious people are sort of saying, you know, there's no afterlife, uh, there's no universal moral code. Uh, when you're gone, when you're dead, that's kind of it. You know? So if you do that in conjunction with, and you're an idiot if you don't believe it, is a little bit of a hard sell. So, so he, and it's, it, there's a lot of controversy now between whether that's the best thing to do because, uh, like I told, these two guys that were out there who were very intelligent, very eloquent, very nice, and very smart guys who had some interesting thoughts about, you know, they were, they were, what were they? Danny, were they, they weren't Baptists, but were they? I don't remember what they were exactly, but uh, what's the one with the P? Not Presbyterian, but Pentecostal. Pentecostal, yes, Pentecostal, right? So, like, it was a Jesus thing, you know, like, heavy, heavy, you got to be soaked in the blood to, you know, have, you know, forever the love of the thing, whatever, fine. Um, <laughs> which, which and it, you know, I had just enough terms that I could, like, at one point, uh, <laughs> the guy said, well, you know, it says in John 3.16, and I said, yeah, for he so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son. And he kind of went, you know, <laughs> like, there was this little, <laughs> you know, it's like just a second of, uh, okay, why did, why, yeah, right, that's my line, exactly, yeah, why does the atheist know that? The culmination of which, we talked for about 35 minutes. Uh, it turns out this guy was in a car accident. He was like, you know, he was Christian, but not really hardcore when he was 20 years old. He's in a car accident. The guy next to him dies. He survives. He, t he gives me this list of his injuries. He's like, I got a metal pin. He's from, uh, I think, Alabama or something. I got a metal pin. I got a thing. I got a plate. I got, here's a scar. Here's this, here's that, you know. And only through the grace of God, I know that, you know, Jesus was watching over me. Which, mm, <laughs> And, and it was hard to just be like, well, that's really stupid. You know, and it was hard to not say that, but, but I kind of said, okay, and I backed off a little bit. And then later on, I said, you know, do you think that God was guiding the hands of your doctors? Because, like, probably a whole mess of doctors helped out. He said, oh, yeah, I had the best doctors. They were amazing. And I said, like, kind of like what they, what they learned. And, and, like, do you think that, you know, maybe God was guiding their hand to maybe get him to think, like, okay, the doctors really helped, you know, because if, if you had been left on the side of the road, you know, sort of like bleeding, like uh, all the faith really, I, I don't know. I mean, I, that's like just my, and I kept saying it that way. That's just, that's just my, that's just my thing. I just, I'm not sure. That's kind of how I would approach it. Like the titanium rod is a really cool, like science thing that sort of <laughs> helps you. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just, that's kind of how I look at it. The culmination of which, and I think the best, the best point of this whole thing was that we sort of ended the conversation by saying, I hope we can both walk away from this conversation so that at some point when you, and I'm saying to this guy, when you are in the middle of your church service or you know, Sunday coffee, whatever the heck it is, and you're amongst people that are like-minded, and let's say the topic of atheism comes up, and someone says, you know, all atheists are blank, whatever, evil, mean, nasty, cruel, gorgeous. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> you can say, well, I met one, or a couple actually, that were very nice and were willing to talk. And it was actually kind of, it was fine. And I said, and conversely, if I'm ever in a conversation where someone says, you know, Christians are all idiots because they believe in that stuff, I'll say, well, you know, actually, no. Because I met these two guys that were really smart and really pleasant and were nice to talk to. And maybe it'll slightly change a little bit of the perception on each side. Turns out this guy's a fan of, like, Dimitri Martin, which was like, I couldn't believe it was a stand-up comic. who's pretty out, but he loves Dimitri Martin. I'm just like, okay, I never would have guessed a Pentecostal Christian from Alabama would like Dimitri Martin. But why wouldn't he like Dimitri Martin, you know? That's like my bias, you know? So, uh, I don't know if there's a point, but that was kind of the idea of, like, kind of cool that we could sort of see each other and maybe at some point, I told this story at TAM a couple of years ago. Um, I was at a 7-Eleven uh, getting a squishy or something and as I walked out, there was this, there was this uh, Latina like grandma with a flat tire and she, had, she was like holding, holding the, the, the jack, like not even, I mean, I don't even know what she was holding, but she, she knew that there was a device in the trunk which is supposed to help the situation 
but that was it, you know? <laughs> so she was just, I, I don't, I'm not sure for, I think, I'm not, I think. So I said, you have a flat? She's like, yes. Yeah. So, look, I'll help you. So I, I changed the flat, you know? And so, oh, thank you, thank you. Can I give you something? Can I give you something? And I said, no, 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 no it's, to it's completely fine. But if anyone ever says a bad thing about an atheist or someone who doesn't believe in God, be sure to tell them, well, one time this atheist changed my tire. <laughs> All right, you know what we should do? What, sh what should we do? Let's do this. Oh, is, 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 Marion, are you in the back? No, okay, never mind. Uh, uh, I should probably, should probably ding us later. Let's do, uh, Let's do this. All right. I need, I need, I need, I need bagpipes. So you guys have to be bagpipes for a minute, okay? I just need, I need a B flat. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, that's great! Tis time once again for Rupert McClanahan's Bastards Who Wouldn't Die, featuring 100% true stories of indestructible bastards. Take it away. Rupert, that's fucking great. Give yourselves a hand. That's great. <laughs> All right, uh, this week we've got the top eight indestructible bastards uh, special execution edition. All right. Uh, number eight is uh, John Henry. Oh, this is from uh, Zachary Miner on the uh, website listverse.com. All right. Uh, uh, top eight. Indestructible Bastards, Special Execution Edition. Uh, jo uh, number eight, John Henry George Lee, uh, 1864. Uh, in 1884, at her home in England, Miss Emma Kaiser was bludgeoned to death with an axe, her throat slashed with a knife, and her house set on fire. You know, the good old days. Uh, John Lee, who was one of the servants at the house, was arrested and convicted of her murder and sentenced to death by hanging. When Lee was standing at the gallows waiting to die, the trapdoor release malfunctioned, not just once, not just twice, but three times. Amid the confusion of these botched attempts, Lee was returned to his cell, and at some time later, the Home Secretary reduced his sentence to life imprisonment with the recommendation that he never be released. Number seven, William Duell, 1724. Uh, in 1740, 16 year old William Duell was convicted of raping and murdering a girl in the village of Tyburn, London. Duell was sentenced to death by hanging along with four others. After the execution, Duell's body was brought to a surgeon's hall to be uh, anatomized. When he was stripped and laid bare on the board, one of his servants noticed he was breathing. After Duell's breath became quicker and quicker, the surgeon took some blood from him, and in two hours, he was able to sit up in a chair. Uh, that evening, the authorities decided to reprieve him, and his sentence was commuted to transportation, which I have no fucking idea what that means. <laughs> he went to Australia. <laughs> that's what that means. <laughs> We're going to transport you to Aust... Oh, that's great. Ooh, I need a means of transportation. <laughs> That's great. Wow. Wow. All right. <laughs> Why does it mean that? No, I know that's where the criminals went. <laughs> it's where the criminals went. <laughs> I mean, the word transportation, like, just because it's transport, and that just, they, 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 they wow. Yeah. Wow. But it wouldn't be like Kuala Malanging or, uh, Woola woola wing or uh, <laughs> twonga dang twanging. <laughs> I've been ton twonga nagged. <laughs> Sorry, I'm mixing up my accents. All right, uh, uh, Wenzel, uh, number six, Wenzel Mogwell, uh, around 1880. Uh, in March 18th of 1915, Wenzel Mogwell was captured while fighting in the Mexican Revolution. Without trial, he was sentenced to be executed by fighting squad. Uh, Mogul was shot nine times, including a final bullet through his head at close range by an officer to ensure death. Uh, Mogul uh, somehow survived and managed to escape. Nine shots and one to the head. Um, 
when Salah went on to live a full life after his quote-unquote execution. Uh, there's a great picture of this man on the show, uh, Ripl or on, the on the sort of newsreel of uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and they say, uh, um, he's on the radio show pointing to a scar from the bullet that was shot at close range. And to say that he's pointing at the scar is kind of like saying Buzz Aldrin was pointing at the moon, because it's this crater in his face. <laughs> That like you couldn't you couldn't not bloody see the thing, but he's pointing to it like, oh there it is. Oh all right, <laughs> that missing cheek and ear and eye. Oh that's the, that's where the yeah. it's a great picture. It's just like yeah okay, as opposed to like I'm on the moon. <laughs> uh, where are we here? Ooh, number five, John Smith. This is around 1690. John Smith from England was convicted of robbery and was sentenced to death by hanging at Tyburn. On Christmas Eve, having been turned off the back of the, a cart, he dangled for 15 minutes until the crowd began to shout, Reprieve! And was then cut down and taken to a nearby house where he soon recovered. So he fucker was swung from the thing for 15 minutes, much like Mel Gibson probably, if he was making the movie version, and they said, Reprieve! Reprieve! And they cut him down. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, number four, Anne Green. This is around 1630. Anne Green was a 22-year-old woman from England who was most likely seduced by the grandson of her employer. When Green became pregnant, she hid her pregnancy and gave birth to a premature baby boy who soon died thereafter. Green was accused of uh, murdering the baby and was sentenced to death by hanging. Once again, the good old days. Uh, during the execution, Anne Green had to climb the ladder up to the gallows where the rope was laid around her neck and then was pushed off the ladder. ladder. <laughs> After about half an hour, her body was cut down and placed in a coffin and taken to a local doctor. When the doctors and others assembled for the dissection opened the coffin, they noticed that the <gasps> corpse took a breath and they heard sounds coming from her throat. <laughs> Probably something sounding like, you fuckers. <coughs> After giving her hot drinks, she opened her eyes. Twelve hours after the execution, Anne Green was able to say a few words. After her unique rescue, the court usher attending the execution and the prisoner, prison director of Oxford agreed that Anne should be reprieved. Uh, Green later married, had three children, and lived for 15 years after her execution. That's great. Uh, number three, Joseph Samuel. This is around 1780. Joseph Samuel was born in England and later transported to Australia interesting. After committing a robbery <laughs> in 1801, uh, Samuel then became involved in a gang in Sydney and robbed the home of a wealthy woman. A policeman who had been sent to protect her home was murdered. The gang was soon caught and, the, and at the trial, Joseph Samuel confessed to stealing the goods but denied being part of the murder. Joseph Samuel was sentenced to death by hanging. In 1803, Samuel and another criminal were driven in a car to Paramata where hundreds of people came to watch the hanging. After praying, uh, the cart on which they were standing drove off, but instead of being hanged, the rope around Samuel's neck snapped. The executioner tried again. This time, the rope slipped and his legs touched the ground. <laughs> With the crowd in an uproar, the executioner tried for a third time, and the rope snapped again. You thought you were having a bad day with the elevators, right? <laughs> um... This time, an officer galloped off to tell the governor what had happened, and his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. The governor and others believed that it was a sign from God that Samuel should not be hanged. Uh, interesting fact. Samuel was one of Australia's earliest Jewish settlers and became known as the man they could not hang. <laughs> Maggie Dixon, uh, number two. Maggie Dixon lived in Edinburgh, Scotland in the early 18th century. After her husband deserted her in 1723, she was forced to move further south to Kelso near the Scottish border. She worked for an innkeeper in return for basic lodgings mm -hmm, and started an affair with the innkeeper's son, which led to her becoming pregnant. Uh, not wanting the innkeeper to discover this because it would surely lead to her dismissal, she concealed the pregnancy as as long as possible. Of course, after the baby was stillborn, and uh, uh, stillborn, she was accused of killing the baby. Uh, the same day the baby was discovered and traced to Maggie, she was charged under the Contravention of the Concealment of Pregnancy Act. 
Maggie was taken back to Grass Market for a public execution by hanging. After the hanging, she was pronounced dead, and her body was bound for Musselburgh, where she was to be buried. However, <laughs> the journey was interrupted by a knocking and a banging from within the wooden coffin. The lid was lifted to find Maggie alive and well. The law saw it as God's will, and she was freed to live for another 40 years. Number one, Willie Francis. In 1945, Willie Francis, at age 16, was charged with murder of a drugstore owner in St. Martinsville, Louisiana. Uh, Francis confessed to the murder in writing after he was interrogated. He later uh, directed the police to where he disposed the holster used to carry the murder weapon. Despite two separate written confessions, Francis pleaded not guilty. Two days after the trial began, Francis was convicted of murder and was sentenced to death by the electric chair. On May 3rd, 1946, during the execution, as the lethal surge of electricity was being applied, witnesses reported hearing the teenager scream, take it off, take it off, let me breathe. The electric chair failed to kill Willie Francis. It turned out that the portable electric chair had been improperly set up by an intoxicated prison guard. <laughs> Why don't you drink, George? Yeah. Um, interesting fact. After the botched execution, Francis appealed to the Supreme Court, uh, citing various violations of his 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendment rights. The appeal was rejected, and Willie Francis was executed on May 9th, 1947, over a year after his first execution. The top eight bastards who wouldn't die. There you go. Just so you know, is this live? Cool. Just so you know, we do have lots of tree buckets right over here, and actually the entire catalog is available right over there. Please see Ms. Info after the show. Uh, um, Everything is 10 bucks, and we have a bunch of posters. If you'd like one, feel free to take one. Uh, whoever gets there kind of first in a common, orderly fashion can help yourself to... Uh, actually, can you just show me for everyone? But in poster form, in poster form. So if you'd like one of these, there's, I don't know, there's probably like a hundred maybe, maybe even less, but uh, help yourselves to it, all right? Cool. Sweet. Ooh, let me get some more water. The new guitar, yes, the new, there she is. Here she is, the new guitar, just got this. And, uh, um, I can actually say, now the Martin, the, uh, I'm just telling you this, so don't tell anybody else. But the Martin Factory, this is a Martin guitar. The Martin Factory is in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. I live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's one town over. Yes, it's Nazareth and Bethlehem, I know. Whatever. Emmaus is another thing, and, and uh, yeah. Um, so I got in touch, and I said, you know, uh, I got in touch with the Martin people, and I said, uh, you know, I'm going to Atlanta and Chicago and uh, Texas and Australia and Finland and... And they said, okay, okay, enough. Uh, so they said, you can be considered a preferred Martin artist, which is kind of cool. So that means basically I get free strings is what it means. But hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. Here's, uh, here's one off the new record here. If you're not familiar with it, this is kind of the happy, sad, awful, awesome song. Just remember, everything alive will die someday, and that's okay. It's the great equating factor in the world. Like some decimated tractor, we all run out of gas. This life can't last, because everything alive will die someday. I used to worry that my folks would someday die. Cause that meant if they could, then that meant so could I. Too young to handle this morose philosophy. I'd rather get high my way climbing up a tree. And looking at the huge small world I could survey. I wondered what it'd feel like on that final day. And calculated the heartbeats left in my lot. And realized I'd best relax and just enjoy the time I've got. I'd remember that everything alive will die someday. And 
That's okay. From the single cellular to grandiose. Seems we're all destined to be toast. Every leaf, bush, shrub, and tree will cease to be. Because everything alive will die someday. Every empire crumbles, every mammoth stumbles to the ground. Ally and enemy both kick the bucket equally. And in this truth there lies a fact. If you ignore those who distract, you might get to realize the fairness of unfairness is in everything's demise. You should remember that everything alive will die someday, and that's hard to say. But to me, it's more a blessing than a curse. Is this a chorus or a weird verse? Every hand that's ever writ will up and quit. Cause everything alive will die someday. But in the meantime, I get to see you smile, and that makes it Okay, for a while, to look into your eyes is worth the eventual demise of Earth and of every living cell. What the hell? We get to be like Deborah and Clyde for a few days. Let's all remember that everything alive will die someday. That's hard to say, but you should do just whatever you will. Don't ever cause any ill and historic reversal. Don't you know this is the only chance we've got it? I don't mean an awful lot. This is the show and not some rehearsal. Those who talk of an extra inning imply this is just a beginning. There's no prize you will be winning. Your existence is enough of a reward to keep you grinning. Or at least it well should be. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's pass the cards down to the center aisle. Ms. Info will walk down the aisle, hand them to her, while I play this next little tune. Now, uh, this is like uh, SATs or something, right? You know? Okay. Um, oh, why not? Let's do it. No, I'll do this one first. I'll do this one first while you're hanging in. Uh, this is another new one off of Trebuchet. Uh, and I think most of you will identify with this. And some of you might identify on one side, or some of you might identify on the other side. But um, see what you think. Uh, When I was your age, the phone was tied to the wall with a kinky, twisty, three-and-a-half-foot cord. It's hard to believe, but it had a ring that could not be turned off or ignored. You couldn't choose the sound of the ring. It was just the sound we called the phone. We'd never heard of a ringtone. When I was your age, the video games looked nothing like the illustrations on the box. All of the graphics consisted of nothing more than simple lines and dots. Missiles were just a few pixels, and the jungle swinging guy was a stick figure. Nothing bigger. When I was your age. When I was your age. When I was your age, we had this stuff called film you would stick in a camera before you took a shot. And then you had to wait like a week until you could tell what pictures you got. You would hand the film to a guy in a parking lot who lived in a booth. Yeah, it's the truth. 
When I was your age, you had to wait till the movie was either in the theater or on TV. If you want an adventure, you couldn't rent adventure, you just had to wait and see. And once you were watching, you couldn't stop or pause. <laughs> or even rewind. We didn't mind. When I was your age. One day I'll figure out how to get those like lines to appear when I do that across the screen. Out early. You see me as a grown up. Singing from a stage. I bet you can't believe I was ever your age. I like watching Star Wars, but I hear you like Star Wars more than me. I wanted to be Indiana Jones, and Dr. Jones is who you aspire to be. And I liked playing with Legos, and Legos are what you currently build and rearrange. I guess some things never change. When I was your age, I didn't like doing homework, but when it was finished, it always felt real good. I didn't like brushing my teeth, but I brushed my teeth because Bert and Ernie said that I should. I didn't like listening to Mom, though I knew deep inside it was the right thing to do. And so do you. You know what's true? Before you can say boo, you'll be my age too. Yeah, you will. Thank you. All right. There is, um, there is one song that I, that I wrote a couple years ago, which um, I've never actually done in the place that inspired it. So I thought, were you very special people? Because you're all beautiful people. You're a beautiful audience. <laughs> and I mean that from the bottom of my colon. I couldn't. I couldn't think of a better. Uh, where's Sigler? Give me a good. Give me a good organ name. Pancreas. pancreas yeah. <laughs> in the bottom of my pancreas. <laughs> Scott's the go-to biology disgusting guy. So just in case you're wondering. <laughs> and speaking of which, uh, perfect song. Um, <laughs> I've never. This is a song that's. Um, oh, you'll figure out what it's called, and it's nice to play it here for you people because now it has a totally different meaning for me. And. Uh, this is the first time I'm playing this song in Atlanta, and this is called Atlanta. I was lost, the roads left did not seem right. Cover the coast. Spare change picked up after each fight. Saw the path that I was bound to take. Although I checked the math, I refused to admit a mistake. Oh, I have 
of the charts I refuse to admit where I was How could I know that my rescue was just out of sight Synthetic for someone to adore us, but I found the trail because the sands had all shifted, overwhelmed by the weight of the Lord that was lifted. Thank you very much. You're very kind. All right. Give me them questions, baby. What should we do? How are we doing? Oh, let's do this here. Holy Jesus. Holy hala hala kala kala kala. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry. <coughs> when <coughs> after Phil gave his don't be a dick speech. I, I obviously wasn't at TAM. I had I had multiple gigs. I couldn't be there. But uh, I get home, and there's a little red light flashing on my answering machine. And it's Phil. And he says, OK, you might hear some stuff. I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> Thanks. It was very nice. Because ni he made a point of like, you know, in an entertainment context, it's a different thing. If you're being snarky and fun for a joke, pen and tell or whatever, it's a slightly different thing as opposed to one on one being a douchebag. So, oh, right. Let's see. Oh, by the way, uh, best, yeah, best question uh, gets a. This is the actually literally last one we have of these. Sure. Wow. Phil's on the Ustream stream. Is he? Anything you want to say, Phil? I love you, Philip. Philip, let me look at the camera. Where's the camera? There's a camera right there. Over there? No, that's the TV, you see? The t oh, it's over here. Oh, is that the one? <laughs> Come in really close. Come in really close. Really close. Really close. All right, let's see if this will work. Let's see if this. Oh, we did this last time. It might be really cool this time. Phil, this is just for you. Ready? I'm just a poor boy. Nobody loves me. He, he, get the TV in the thing. Wait, wait, wait. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. Spare him his life for this monstrosity. Easy come, easy go. Will you let me go? Miss Milla, no, you will not let me go. Miss Milla, no, you will not let me go. Let me go, will not do the let me go, let me go, let me go. Oh, oh. The JRF is so proud of their boy. 
This is the last Think For Yourself t-shirt we have, so uh, before we print up some more, hopefully. So this is the prize for the best question. So I told you that after you wrote it, so there's nothing you can do. Uh, let me do this. <laughs> I bet it's not Phil on the, use on, the th on the stream. I bet it's one of his, like, Discovery Channel interns. <laughs> you know, blogging as Phil played. Someone, some, some like Indonesian, you know, seven-year-old is chained to a desk. <laughs> How do you spell halakalikalakulak? <laughs> Back to work. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. Right, Phil? Is that is that what's going on? Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> Question, where do you get the ideas for all the puns you post on your Facebook and Twitter? Every time I read them, I feel like I'm being... Phil. Is it? Yeah. Is it on the phone? Oh, well, yeah, like, I'll call him back and I'll like, let you know what happened. Or is it? Yes, please. Okay. Please. <laughs> the speakerphone function is bro broken on that phone, right? It doesn't... <laughs> so we couldn't patch him in if we have to... Yeah. No, we'll patch them in. We'll totally patch them in. All right, we're going to call them back. All right, where do you get the ideas for all the puns you post on Facebook and Twitter? If I knew where, what part of the brain that comes from or what's involved, I would have it removed. Because <laughs> it, it's like a combination of like laughter and shame when I create this stuff, so it's a very weird thing. It's very mundane. What I do is I literally sit with a, a I go to a Flickr, and I open up a Flickr page, and it says interesting, new interesting things in the last seven days. We okay? Everybody all right? We're good. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt or anything. I, yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I open a Flickr page and I just see and I go interesting last seven days and it shows like nine photos at, at, at once and you just kind of click through and wait for something to kind of kick you in the taint, you know? And <laughs> every now and then it's like oh, because you see a picture like it's just it's completely. I have to be visual. It's some visual stimulus that does it. And you know how many pictures of 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 flowers and puppies there are on Flickr <laughs> and birthday cakes and 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 dudes who don't look like women who are trying to look like women <laughs> like who really don't look like I mean, hey man good for you it's awesome you know and but there's just a lot there's a lot <laughs> uh, peaches or nectarines ooh nectarines no contest because of the fuzz thing. Um, when writing music, do you noodle for hours till you find something awesome, hear things in your head and try to play it, or a combo? If it's a combo, is it more noodling or more, or more hearing things in your head percentage? Um, I don't know. I've talked about writing music so much. To be honest, if I knew what worked in the process of writing music, in all honesty, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys right now. I'd be writing music. So it would be like... <laughs> You know, like, okay, I got to do A, B, and C, and I'll write, uh, like, ask I mean, most any, any person who creates art, like, we have no idea how it works. We really don't. I mean, there's little, you can kind of nudge and get yourself in a place that might result in something, but for the most part, we have no idea, and that's why we like to go to conventions, because it just <laughs> kills time. So, holy crap. <laughs> okay, I don't know how we can get this. Uh, my mom did this, which is the weirdest thing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do emit hearts like that, too. I don't know if you've... <laughs> you just, the lights have to be way down, and I have to be eating uh, Velamint green uh, mints, and it happens. So, yeah, it's really cool. Wow, that's... Uh, that's yeah, thank you. I will, I will do something with that. <laughs> 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 we'll put that in the Hall of Fame on, as in case the table's moving back and forth. It's like, oh, yeah, put it underneath there, yeah. Uh, have you ever, no, because it's me, it's drawn beautifully, but it's me, yeah. Have you ever felt so passionate about an idea, but no matter how many times you try, you just can't get it just right? If, if so, what was the original musical idea? This is a first draft, by the way, so. <laughs> uh, uh, have you ever felt so passionate about an idea, but no matter how many times you try, you just can't get it right? You never get it right never get it right. You just kind of get it to the point where it's okay and you move on. That's pretty much, I mean, it's never, it's, it, uh-oh. Is he there? Oh, dude.
Phil, it's just me and you. There's no one else here. <laughs> say hi to the say hi to Dragon Con. This is Dr. Plate's assistant at Discovery Channel. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I gotta turn it up. Hold on, hold on. Okay. You know, there's like a whole Einsteinian relativity thing going on here as I'm watching you and I'm delayed a several seconds, but I can hear myself <laughs> over my own. Oh, cool. Cool. Back into my brain and it's all I don't I just I don't know what to say now. Okay, uh, who here watched the Phil Plates Bad Astronomy? Bad Universe, Bad Universe. Who thought Bad Universe fucking kicked ass? That's it. That's it. That's all I can say. Okay, this, this isn't being recorded, is it? No, 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 no. They, they can't hear me, right? No, no, no it's just you and me. It's just you and me. They can't hear this I at all. talk about how, how special the other night was and... <laughs> You're very gentle for a bald man. Say, say that again, one more time. You're very gentle for a bald man. <laughs> it's the nair, I'm telling you. It works great. It really works great. So, yeah, all right. I, I don't want to... <laughs> you're a very good sport. A big round of applause for Phil Plate, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Phil. He probably just violated some discovery clause. I'm sure, like, he is, uh, it's, it's my fault. I'm sorry. It's my fault. It's my fault. Here's a great question. What? That's a front runner. That's a front runner. Very good. What's a good way to get a believer friend to attend a Skeptrack panel? Uh, I tricked him into the Skeptics party last night. That may have been a mistake. He now will not attend any skeptical panels with me. That might have been a mistake. Yeah. Uh, 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 find a common find a common thing that you both. Uh, well, jeez. Mm, yeah. After. You know. Uh, um, s uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> say yeah. You just have to yeah, ease him into it and say that not all skeptics are, are are there are different. There are many kinds of skeptics and many kinds of tracks. And let's look at the list here and see what might interest you and uh, and uh, whatever. Uh, Kirk or Picard? Well, for me, I'm sorry. You can probably guess. Picard. That's right, Picard. Sorry, sorry. How do they use an auto tune in a live performance? Ooh, uh, good question. What are, wait, what are the things that tell you auto tune is being used? Yeah, there's a. For those of you that don't know, there's a there's a device which is called auto tune. For the most recordings, you have this. You know, T pan has that kind of sound. That's very mechanical. T pan, T pain. Sorry, T pain. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Payne. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> but it's spelled P. T it's how's it spelled? P A I N. Really? Oh, P A Y N E. No, no. T T T T Payne. I thought it was T P A N. All right. All right. Cool. Well, T Payne is the most famous kind of. But it's pronounced pain. Yeah, I mean, T bread. He's T bread. That's very lovely. Tipin, très bon. Um, th there's, a, there's a certain shimmery quality to auto-tune. You, you, once you sort of hear what that shimmery quality sounds like, that's what it is. When they do it live, either there's a sequencer which is playing along with the band, which is telling the auto-tune, okay, the, 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 the lead off of the microphone, the, let's say the lead singer is singing into, is being fed first through this device, which knows, okay, the chord that's being sung right now, or the note that's supposed to be being sung in this part of the of the song, is this is an A, let's say. So if, so if he or she is going sharp or flat, it's going to auto tune it automatically. That means the band has to be sort of all synced up and together and in time. And it's a very interesting and pretty amazing thing, but it kind of blows when you know it's like supposed to be a live performance and it's not. However, we're just getting more and more used to hearing auto tune, so I think uh, I think like most things like that, it'll kind of go away for a while. Every vocal every vocal had chorus on it. And then every vocal had a very short reverb on it. And then every vocal had, there's all these things that kind of get fashionable for a while that then <laughs> go away. I mean, the Beatles had this great thing, this, this uh, uh, slap back echo. You know, the sound that's can come together, that kind of, you know, that's, that's a slap back, you know. And that was very popular for a while. I think it'll, 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 it'll wear itself out. But that's how they do it live, which is pretty amazing. Um, hey, George, who would win in a fight, Darth Vader or Voldemort? Like Voldemort, yeah, I think that's pretty right because he can like appear and disappear and do all kinds of stuff, and and uh, and he's impervious to stink bombs. <laughs> huh? He's got no nose. Thing. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that, Joe. Okay, and he's full of hate. Yeah, uh, George, how far is it? <laughs> it's 
good. Diet Coke or Coke Zero? Coke Zero. Very good, yeah. <laughs> Who needs a performer? Would a two-toed sloth make a good pet? Uh, <laughs> depends what your foot fetish is, I guess. <laughs> uh, why could the Mayans only count to 2012? Because they were, they were too busy trying to find vowels in cats, 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 cats. That's why. And follow up, uh, where does the time go? Yes. <laughs> where does the time go? Yeah, ask a Mayan. Ask a Mayan. Um, why would the city of Atlanta not sell liquor after midnight tonight? Or is this a myth? No, no. no it's not a myth? Bars close at midnight tonight? Oh, grocery stores. Bars are open until 2 or whatever. Okay, so grocery stores, oh, because it's a Sunday, it's a blue law, which uh, that's like my favorite favorite word for a law, a blue law. What do you do on a Sunday? Well, I blue law. I <laughs> <coughs> See, I wouldn't want that if I could get rid of it, but it's like it's in there, and there's nothing I can really do. Do you ever get, did you ever get the recipe for the, the, the dessert nachos? Oh, the cannoli nachos. Uh, if so, why are you keeping it from us? Actually, Carrie P. sent me a... Uh, a recipe for cannoli nachos. Cannoli nachos, uh, this was a gig that I played uh, a couple, a couple of, geez, months ago. It was one of these deals where uh, the staff forgot to put out dessert at the end of the wedding. And the couple had planned to have these wonderful cannoli nachos. Now imagine cannoli filling, okay? You get that, you get that cream cheese, mint, vanilla, not mint, but vanilla kind of goodness thing that comes in the inside of the tube. Now you remove it from the tube and you put it in a bowl and then you take the, the crumbly tube thing and crush it up into like chips or you make chips with that tube stuff and then instead of having the messiness of like, you know, <laughs> you, you, you just have a dip and it's a hump. And they forgot to put them out. So we're playing the last song, you know, people all over the world, join hands, start a love train. Look, good night, everybody. And like the staff is running out. <laughs> so they proceed to put like 20 pounds of cannoli nachos on each table. Like boom, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And the guests are all, you know, love train has been played, so everyone's leaving. And um, fine, it stinks, but that kind of happens often. Now, the thing is, we, of course, have to pack up all of our gear afterwards. So I'm, we're packing up the gear, and the staff now comes out with a big trash bin, you know, this big thing on wheels, and they're going from table to table, and it's, you know, you just hear this, you hear this dessert thump. <laughs> and a little portion of my pancreas dies <laughs> with every thump. Because to me, it's just like sweetness, dessert, cannoli nachos. So I kind of like went to one table and tried a few, and they were really good. And as they're just throwing them out, I mean, they're just throwing them out. Um, the person said, do you want some of these? I'm just like, duh. So I grabbed the thing, <laughs> you know. End of a four-hour gig, sentences are hard enough, let alone when there's like cannoli nachos in front of you. So, so uh, I, I grabbed the bowl, took it back to the band, and Gary, our bass player, who is not a dessert guy, he's really fit, he does marathons, he's like super fit, he, he's a, pretty much a vegetarian or whatever, he tried one, and he said, you know, I don't like dessert, but this is the best fucking dessert I've <laughs> ever had. I was like, yeah. So, so Carrie P. found, a, found, a, found a, a thing, and she sent it to me. So, uh, do you shave in the shower? Yes, I do. All over. Uh, George, Vibraphone, hey, do you know you have a brand new Wikipedia page? <gasps> Is it up? Yeah. Where's Tim? <gasps> Tim, f Tim, Tim Farley from What's the Harm did my Wikipedia page. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is almost as good as dessert. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh, this is so cool. Harb? George Harb? Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm joking, Timothy. You're a doll. You're a doll, Tim. Oh, this is great. When did this go live? Like an hour ago. Oh, my God. Oh, thank you. Another hand, please, for Tim. Yay. Ooh, that's exciting. That's exciting. I get to do a spit take with Tom Servo and have a Wikipedia page, which you can add to the Wikipedia page if you would like. Um, 
It's already being done. Yes, fantastic. Um, oh, great. George, why is there something rather than nothing in this goddamn universe of ours? Can you explain? <laughs> I think that was like show 170 or something. I did about 25 minutes on that, so please go back and check that out. Uh, this was written in the dark, obviously. George, what movie or TV show or chow. What, t yeah, what TV show do you think best represents skeptical themes other than Mythbusters? Oh, yeah, other than the best one? <laughs> other than the one that does it perfectly? What would you say is one? Uh, yeah, gosh. Uh, uh, um, uh, some say Scooby-Doo. Yeah. yeah, but that's like, uh, you know. Bad, I, I, bad, universe. bad Universe. Oh, Bad Universe. Big ba oh, Big Bang Theory. Okay, yeah, good one. Holes? Bullshit. Oh, thank you. Bullshit. Yes, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, there's no prize for screaming stuff out, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, yes, there is, motherfucker. Um, oh, boy. What's the best way to come out to one's family as an atheist? Slow and patiently or all at once? Um, <laughs> You know, it'd be good. Just, it, it depends on what part of the country you live, but you could be like, uh, Dad, I'm gay. Just kidding. I don't believe in God. Uh, that's probably not. Yeah. Actually, that'd probably be a worse thing to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I yeah, I don't know. It depends on your parents, man. It totally depends on the people you deal with. It's like anything. It depends on your on your parents. I would say I would say be the most important thing is to be the best example you can possibly be, which sounds like a tricky load of shit, but it's totally true. Be the best person you can be, and then you can't get called anything. If someone says you can't, no, you can't be an atheist because, and you say why, and they say because A, B, C, and D, if you're not A, B, C, and D, you've won the argument. And there's nothing, you can, there's nothing else that can be said about it. You know, you're going to be immoral, you're going to be this, you're going to be that, period. That's it. Be the best person, the best human, the best member of society you can be. And you've won the argument without even arguing. Friends, now send in twenty five ninety five for my plane, please. Uh, would you suggest that someone do? What would you suggest that someone do to prevent hair loss? You are you are fucked, my friend. <laughs> Nothing you can do. You're gonna look like this. You have to distract with with suits. That's that's the thing you have to do. <laughs> and no socks. That's the thing. It's like. Why does that guy have no socks? Oh, he's bald, too. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Are you free for dinner tomorrow, 7 o'clock? Oh, it's a good one. You may ask yourself. Come in really close. Come in really close. I got the glasses for it too. It's still that video is still the balls. It is still that is a cheap little video, uh, once in a lifetime, right? Talking heads. If you haven't seen this video, YouTube it, Google it. It's Twyla Tharp helped out. I know the the woman who did. Uh, oh, Mickey, you're so fine. What's her name? Tony Basil, she was a choreographer on this thing. It, 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 you know, at the time, it was cutting edge. Now the effects are very cheesy, but what's happening in this video is so cool and artsy and completely holds up. I think completely holds up. Uh, if you could meet anybody from the past, who and why? Uh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between a humorist and a comedian? About $20,000 probably. <laughs> uh, do you believe in invisible, intangible pink elephants? Can you prove they don't exist? Oh, you're too clever. Um, <laughs> if you had to describe the world as a type of clothing, what would it be? <laughs> would you want to wear it? <laughs> if you had to describe the world as a type of clothing, <laughs> um, Depends. <laughs> I am wearing it. Yeah. Uh, if your belly button detritus itches during a performance, 
what? what? <laughs> oh, what do you do if your belly button detritus itches during a performance? How big is your belly button, dude? <laughs> belly button, I mean, we all have belly button detritus, don't get me wrong, but it's like, before I lost like all the weight, I used to keep my car keys in there just to cut them, have them, but uh, yeah. Um, no, it's not the, it's not the, the belly button, the belly button itching is not the main concern. The main concern is the P-spot. That's the main concern during performance because usually right before, I didn't do it today because, because I just didn't want to, but normally right before a performance, you go to the bathroom just to go to the bathroom, you pee just to pee, and uh, uh, invariably there's that little, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, because it's not that you haven't gone, but as you sort of retract and put it back into the <laughs> flap, there's a little bit of, you know, a, a plus not being of, uh, uh, Hebraic uh, ancestry, there's a little bit of a retention, let's say, uh, hooded sweatshirt thing that's happening, which, like, you know, so you have to really be sure to kind of, you know, make, uh, not so much ring it out, because that's not what you want to do, but you just, yeah, it's got to be, so, so the key, here's the key, gentlemen, and ladies, you can do this too if you'd like, but I don't know why you would, but um, the key is, it's, uh, some is going to come out, some is going to, some is going to, regardless, no matter how much you shake, wiggle, and tap, some will end up in your lap which we all know that from grade school, of course, and again, from Father Michael's class. But um, <laughs> what you do, and the, and the key thing to do, and I need, I need two hands to show you how to do this. Um, after you're done, after you're done, gentlemen, uh, uh, now maybe you've had a good shake and a good thing and you're fine and you trust in the, the meniscus of your willy. Maybe you do, I don't know. Um, that's for all the, yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Trust me, it's really funny. Um, uh, uh, what you do instead of just you know returning to the standard thing, you 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 do kind of a a, a folded sort of thing so that so that the the spot will end up here, and when the pant retracts, the, the spot is there, and you want everyone to see it. Sure, that'll be on Wikipedia as well. <laughs> <laughs> what is the minimum that a woman has to be has to wear to be dressed up? I.e., uh, what's the female equivalent of suit and tie? Uh, the minimum that a woman has to wear to be dressed up. Well, for me, it's the shoes. Shoes and almost anything else will probably do. So uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, dressed up. Women's rules are a whole separate thing. I'm sure there's some, some you know, uh, uh, phrenology podcast that talks about women's clothing the same way the geologic talks about men's clothing. So, um, what makes you more excited, Star Trek or pudding? <laughs> what what flavor pudding? It's an illness, man. This fucking food thing is an illness because it's like I get so excited over over the potentiality of food. Like I'll be at a gig and I'll think like, ooh, I haven't eaten in two days, so man, I'm going to have a really good meal. And I'm thinking like you're going to Dragon Con like to, you know, <laughs> share the stage with Tom Servo or something. Like you should enjoy that and not look so much forward to the buffet that might happen on Sunday. <laughs> it's a like total illness. It's really weird, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So uh, I would probably say pudding. <laughs> Uh, George, what's your stance on Fig Newtons? <laughs> I love Fig Newtons, man. And uh, if there's any fig in there, I'll be amazed. Um, okay, why are so many high-profile skeptics bald, white, male, bespeckled? Is this a result of thinking too critically? Yes, <laughs> this is what happens when you sit at home and think too much, kids, so... <laughs> Start watching Jersey Shore. <laughs> uh, Gio, how do you think the world will end? Bonus question, would you like to pet my Tribble? <laughs> I think that will lead to the world ending, actually, if I pet you. <laughs> uh, when doing the, the talk portions of your show, do you find yourself gesturing to no one in particular? Uh, the scary guy near the front. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love, I love to watch uh, people on the phone gesture. Like, just, just sit and watch someone sometimes going, it's not what I said. That's not what, no, there's no way. You look at me because I said, no, you said no, because, because, <laughs> like, 
you realize that they can't see the you part. But that's, it's so ingrained in what we do. It's so ingrained in what we do. I love it. I love it. So uh, uh, yes, I do actually gesture. You have to ask Ms. Info, but yeah, I think I gesture. Uh, Ms. Info, being an Italian, when I want her to, when I want her to, to maybe stop talking for a second, I just grab her hands. <laughs> so it works really well. Um, my Spock ears keep falling off, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing? Okay. How, how do I work this? Very nice. <laughs> Excellent. Who are you going to call? <laughs> what time is it? Yes, 11.15. How deep is the ocean? Uh, who is the world's greatest guitar player? Why? Slough. What is the worst smell you have ever smelled? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the smell that emitted from my soul when I knew I had to be on after Penn and Teller at the first TAM I went to. <laughs> it was like, really? Great. Why? What is the square root of rubber ducky? <laughs> I think it's like pi r mallard or something. Isn't it? No, it's mallard, mallard, mallard over, mallard over pi? No, ma ah, sorry. Mallard pi. Could you please tell us the story behind 50 Stories? Ooh, yeah, sure. 50 Stories is a song on Trebuchet, and it's about two people uh, meeting up. You know how like, you know someone maybe your entire life or at least a big chunk of your life, and you kind of see them at certain points in your life, and uh, you might have something really special with that person, but you're not exactly sure what it is. Like, is it a romantic relationship? Is it a friendship that's really deep? Is it a, a familial relationship? Like, what is that thing? And uh, after having visited uh, someone really special and really, really beautiful in my heart, uh, I wrote this song because it was we both realized we're something, but we don't know what that something is. This is someone I've known for 20 years, and, uh, and we're still trying to figure it out, but we're getting really close, and it's really cool. So that's what that song is about. Um, What's your songwriting process? Again, I, no idea. No idea. Honestly, no idea. Uh, I know that seems like a cop-out, but, but it's like y y something hits you and you just go with it. Uh, George Viber, who was the bald guy who sucked all the talent out of your new guitar last night? <laughs> what? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, yes. No, that was Joe. That was Joe. <laughs> He's right over there. Yeah, did you write this or no? It's just, oh, okay, good. It's, yeah, it's, it's very nice. Yeah, it's self-deprecation with the thing. Uh... How much wood would a woodchuck chuck? If, yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Oh, no, wait. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck had an uh, alliterative name in your home state and wrote about it? <laughs> Not bad. Uh, oh, wait. There's like a little puzzle on the back of this one. I missed that. That's cool. Okay. Uh, a couple more. Why do you identify... What do you identify at the point of your life where you became a skeptic? What do you think led you to skepticism? Uh, um, I was seven years old. I've told this story a couple times, but I was seven years old, and I was going to go see a Yankee game. It was my birthday. My dad was taking me to see the New York Yankees for the very first time. I was very excited, very excited, but the weather forecast was calling for rain. And, of course, if it was going to rain, that means the game would be canceled, and then the birthday, birthday thing would change. So I was in bed praying vehemently, vehemently to the, to the Judeo-Christian God that it would not rain. I'm thinking, like, please, it's my birthday. Please, God, let it not rain. And something struck me where I pictured a similar seven-year-old boy somewhere uh, going to or having to go to like a horrible family reunion the next day unless it rained and he was praying for rain <laughs> and the two of us had legitimate reasons why we wanted it to either rain or not rain and I remember thinking like who wins like who's <laughs> right and that was the very first thing where I thought all right, I'm seven, but this doesn't make sense here. So that's, that's literally how it started. And then it was uh, reading Inherit the Wind in like sixth grade, seventh grade, and it had the word agnostic, which was like, ooh, good activity word, but don't come home and tell your mom that you're an agnostic, especially after you've had Holy Communion, like I think that year, um, <laughs> when she's holding a big pot of boiling water. It's always a good key. So yeah, so that's, that's what it was, that, that sort of illogic of the prayer. Um, I distinctly remember, it's, pr it's pretty amazing that it stuck with me. Uh, I like you. Do you like me? Check yes, check no. <laughs> Who wrote this one? Me. You did? Yeah. Come here. <laughs> I like you.
these are these are a, a very low prescription, or you've all just turned into sp ghosts or something. So, <laughs> what? Well, ooh, cool. <laughs> so, yay, Casey, nicely done. Okay, uh, let's do this. Thank you for the questions, I really appreciate it. Let's move on a little bit. Let's do the Twitter song. I think we should get Scott Sigler. Say, Scott, you wanna do it with me, brother? Can we do that? And you know what, because let's, let's have a continuum from last year. Is Richard Saunders still here? You wanna do it again, Rich? Richard? Yes, do you mind? Awesome! Give it up for opposite polar ends of the global spectrum. Richard, Richard Saunders, and Scott, sir, come on up here. Ms. Info will queue up, will queue up the fantastic uh, uh, Twitter, Twitter stream uh, modulation device, and, and here we go. Here it is, the Twitter song for Dragon Con 2010. Go for it. So who's first? Does it matter? Go for it. Thank you, Gio. Having a picnic during a day at the beach can be actually quite difficult. I'm donating my body to science. Everything except my middle fingers. Those go to the Vatican. He could have better laugh than me right off the top. <laughs> I feel sort of uncomfortable. Wait, 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 are we skipping around? Totally my fault. Give me those glasses again. We can, we can do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, do them in, in, in order. In order. He wants me to do them in order this they're year. On the they're on the screen as well. So, if you can mix up with the technological, not like last year. See, like, like last year, last year I said pick ones you like, but, but this year we're just going to go in order because Ms. Info has the thing. So, here we go. Starting with which one? Yeah, the Lego Pirates one. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Lego pilots, pilots, <laughs> pirates, <laughs> versus Playmobil Knights. Who wins? All right. I could never drink a fifth of vodka because I'm too tense. Or intense. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's whatever. DJ, you did the right thing not coming up here, my friend. <laughs> I thought socialized medicine was what gave what. You gave two. Thank you. <laughs> See if I can get one right here. <laughs> Eating silly putty makes your colon do hilarious things. It's not a surprise because you can all see what's coming. Well, but well, never you can mind. do it like together with the conjunction. So no, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> As a kid, I remember being disappointed on my birthday. I asked for a model, and all I got was a. Little airplane. It's far worse to bite into a cranberry thinking it's a cherry than to bite the head of a bat thinking it's a dove. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, this is the one I wanted to read earlier, I feel sort of uncomfortable and awkward washing whites separately. <laughs> So wait, does a decent moral masochist go to heaven or hell? Think about it, think about it. <laughs> and then it, <laughs> and the You gotta be quick, you gotta be quick. An attractive nun is, is still hard to come by. <laughs> Why? Why? You don't find them very often, no? Yeah. So I was on the radio this morning. No wonder I had such trouble sleeping. <laughs> What's the right thing to get to get Mola Ram on Valentine's Day? Who? Yeah, that's right. Malaram, Malaram. Cover your heart, Indy, cover your heart. <laughs> <laughs> you betrayed Shiva. You betrayed Shiva. Yeah, no Mola Ram? Yep. Kalima, Shakti Day. Kalima. Kalima, thank you, excellent. 
identical twins have the exact same overbite. <laughs> a starter's pistol for a swim race could be considered a pool cue. <laughs> I would assume that just living in a place called Mudville would already inhibit the amount of quantifiable joy. If you drown enough lead singers, you can make a coral reef. I once had my rectal temperature taken with a Galilean thermometer. Now that was a museum tour. Um, no. Picard, telling a waiter how he wants his steak done is n has nothing to do with the Prime Directive. <laughs> Dimples do help a golf ball travel farther. That's why it feels so satisfying to hit Shirley Temple in the face with a nine iron. Remember, the more sides to a dice, the more one-sided the conversation. You could say that that at, well, sorry. You could say that the asshole that shot Harvey Milk was really lactose intolerant. Oh yeah, boo. <laughs> Think how differently Christian jewelry would look if Jesus had been a what? Dr. Richard <laughs> According to Mythbusters, if your car ends up underwater, you shouldn't try to open the doors until you first find a good radio station. <laughs> Best titling slash numerolic, uh, numerological, num num <laughs> numerical. Oh yeah, it's another country. System for a movie series. Uh, series. First Blood, Rambo. First Blood 2, Rambo 3, Rambo. <laughs> you need a license to perform urethral arthroscopic surgery, but any dick with a camera can take a picture. <laughs> Deepak Chopra's use of quantum mechanics to explain his loopy ideas is like using a wood grain to bake bread. <laughs> It's, it's existential. It's okay. yeah. As the Roman thief was stealing part of the entablature, the centurion that walked in on the crime yelled, Freeze! <laughs> this morning I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. First I found out I had, a, I had jaundice, then I accidentally sat on a pigeon. <laughs> A painting by Goya is worth a lot of beans. The Pope's wife is not the Holy See. <laughs> Bjork just showed up at my place to tell me that I've been pronouncing my name wrong. That's weird. <laughs> if you want to have both weird and frivolous nightmares... Oh... I don't know. Fibrous nightmares uh, and well-rested towels. Have your lint catcher and dream catcher trade places. I'm glad you liked it. That's good. That's <laughs> and Kanye is three hours ahead of Kanye West. I love these words you, that you've come up with here, George. Greek Airlines have a pilot and a spanker pilot. <laughs> Thank you. Spanico pilot, that's right. Spanakopita is a type of uh, Greek delicacy. So. Mm. Spanakopita, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. Anyone that hoards magazines really has some issues. <laughs> Remember... An oscillating fan blows air in all directions, and a vacillating fan can't choose between Kirk or Picard. 
Kirk Cameron discussing evolution is like having Dylan record a Pavarotti tribute album. Hilarious, but pointless wrong and kind of scary. <laughs> Never let a bad hunch get in the way of you hearing the bells is my motto. Well, it's more my quasi-motto. <laughs> and... 45 minutes to write. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Sorry, and finally. And finally, mac and cheese is not a Celtic gynecological condition. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Sigler and Dr. Richard Saunders. Let's hear it for him. You are very good sports. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's do one more quick thing before we get out of here because it's, uh, uh, it's getting late, but I love it. I, I, I so thank, uh, so thank, I'm so grateful and so thankful that you guys were uh, hanging out with, uh, with us today. Uh, I want to do one more song, and I would love for all of us to sing this together, because uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do it all together, because I think it'll be fun. So I'll do a couple verses, and then you can all join in, because I think it'll be worth it. Don't forget that uh, Ms. Info is going to be selling stuff afterwards, right over here. Please help yourselves. Everything is 10 bucks. Please take it home. I'll gladly sign whatever you need. We'll hang out as long as we can, all right? The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Just thinking about tomorrow clears away the cobwebs and the sorrow. Till there's none when I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely. I just stick out my chin and grin and say the sun will come out tomorrow so you gotta hang on till tomorrow come what may tomorrow tomorrow I love you tomorrow you're always a day away you all know the words ready George Rob, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I love you all, guys. Thank you, honestly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you really soon.